Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 218, Solved Mysteries. I'm Sean, and somewhat surprisingly, with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. There, that's what we could have done tonight. We could have just had you go live on your own. But anyway, I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record all our episodes live here on Twitch, Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, and we love it when folks join us. So it's a bit of a shock that we're even recording tonight, but we are here, uh, even to the surprise of some of the people in our chat room tonight. Now, our main topic tonight is going to cover what's up, where we've been, and upcoming impacts to our show due to what's going on. Now, once we get everyone up to speed, we will be doing a full episode, so we are going to have two reviews. These are going to be of puzzles, or puzzle-style games. First up is a murder mystery from Mysterious Package Company, who's trying something totally new with their new Body of Evidence series, and the game we'll be looking at is Best Served Cold. Now, this is followed up by a look at a new Quezzle. This is a sci-fi-themed game and puzzle from Unidragon. Then we're going to wrap up with some vacation gaming talk. Find links to games mentioned, past episode callouts, and more through our show notes, which you can find at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 218. Links found there may be affiliate links, which help support this show, while some products discussed during this program have been provided for review by publishers. I think most of what we're talking about today happens to be review copies. But let's get going with a trip to the suggestion box. Welcome to this week's suggestion box. Here we share some of the comments and other interactions we've gotten on our content. First up, we've got Ariel who commented on our D&D Adventure Begins review to say, I bought this game and have never once used it as intended. I actually <laughs> pilfered the cards and the minis for my 5e campaign. Hey, fair enough. Thank you for the comment, Ariel. I got to say, that's not a bad use of that box set. Now, while we didn't hate the game and it's not terrible, it's just... It's not as Dungeons and Dragons as I was hoping. It's more of a weird improv experience for kids um, where the actual role playing doesn't matter. So you go to like hit something and you got to roll the D20 die. But the, the, the improv part is it requires you to describe what you're doing before you roll the die. But what you describe has no impact on the die. So it's kind of a weird intro to role playing that's not actually based on D&D at all, except for the background and the races and the fact you roll a D20 to do everything. I got to say, taking the minis out of there, uh, assuming you got all of them, unlike I, I, our copy, um, and using the cards. The cards do feature some fantastic art, including one of my favorite D&D pictures of all time, which is a shot of some half-flying pirates. I'm pretty sure you can see a shot of that and find out more about the game in our reviews, which I will link in the show notes. Well, next, a comment on our the tabletop gaming deal side of things. Chris Skink writes, I love that you highlight gaming accessories and supplies as well as games themselves. Oh, thanks for that, Chris. Um, that's something that's always iffy. So often I will share things like deals on laminators or wooden bowls to hold your components or laminating pouches or sleeves or uh, Sharpies. Every now and then there's a really good deal on like dry erase markers which are actually excellent, excuse me, which are actually excellent for a bunch of roll and write games. So I got to say, it's it's nice to see, because sometimes when I share those, I get feedback where people are like, just stick to the games. But more often, I hear from people like Chris, who are like, no, no, we appreciate this too, keep it up. So we will continue to share gaming-related things and things like office supplies that apply to gamers as well as game deals. Another big one's Plano. When I see Plano on sale, I tend to share that. And for people who don't know, how useful Plano is for organizing your games. They're like, why, why are you sharing this? And I'm like, no, no, there's a really good game reason why I share this stuff. Well, next we have longtime fan of the show, Chris Groff, who commented on our Psycho Babble review to say, that sounds potentially interesting. The lack of forced lying and the way the hidden traitor mechanic works address my two only complaints about most social deduction games. Uh, exactly. Right. That, that, that's why I like the two. Uh, I think Chris and I are on the exact same page as far as social deduction games. Now, I haven't actually played a social deduction game with Chris, but um, I, I totally get it. That, those are the two things that, that Psycho Babble to me fixes compared to most social deduction games. Now, I don't mind role playing and playing a role in a game, but I don't like games that force me to outright lie to my friends. And I just hidden trader mechanics are generally fiddly and ugly and lots of 
silly things going on with them. Like when you're playing Battlestar Galactic and you're like, everyone read your card for at least a minute because the traitor one has all these rules on it and the your human has nothing on it. So you don't want to give it away by putting your card down. Like you don't want all that stuff and all of that's removed as well. So I've got to say that Chris and I are on exactly the same page. And maybe if we ever hook up at a Canadian game convention, I'll run some psycho babble for you, Chris. Well, Cardboard Duelists shared our Disney Sorcerer's Arena leading the charge review and added this comment. My favorite expansion for Disney Sorcerer's Arena so far. All three of these characters have been a blast to play and very thematic. If you haven't checked out Disney Sorcerer's Arena from the op yet, you definitely should. The game keeps getting better with each new release, and it's an incredibly for affordable game with a theme most uh, people love, Disney characters. I'm glad to see other people are enjoying this game as much as us. Thank you very much for the combat, Cardboard Duelists, uh, which is interesting because that is a channel that is dedicated to two-player dueling-style card games. So it's good to see, like, you know, someone that comes from a Magic the Gathering Pokemon dueling card game background really enjoying Disney Sorcerer's Arena. And I totally agree. Every expansion has made the game better, and I'm shocked how they've been able to tie the theme of the characters into the mechanics of the game. They've done some really neat stuff there that makes it feel like you're playing Mrs. Potts, of all things. But it works. Well, finally, let's wrap up from a comment from our board game quality of life improvements topic from a few weeks back. Uh, Newfler Maz not, uh, says, not default gendering the player as male in your manuals. I can't mm. believe I'm still seeing this in this millennium. Now, I totally agree, but I'm not sure if that's a quality of life improvement. Uh, to me, that's more of a, like, come on, get with the times. Like, you just should be doing that. That's That, that, that doesn't, I, I guess, in a way, it's quality of life in the way we defined it, where we said it has no impact on the actual gameplay. So, so I guess fair enough. But really, that's just a, a, a wake up, like, come on, like nowadays. And and even he, she should be going away, like use the the first and third person. They uh, the, there's really no excuse for it nowadays. And I've got to say, it's kind of funny because as I've been moving games around my house the last couple of weeks, I happened to grab a couple older games, uh, specifically an older RPG. And I started reading through it and it had an entire uh, intro paragraph on how they're going to handle gender but it was still very dual and it was like we're going to use she for G the gm every single time and he for the players and i'm like well you were getting there but nowadays 2023 like come on like seriously that, that, that that's not even quality of life just do it yeah absolutely that's just quality writing not quality of life yeah now remember that we appreciate all your comments even if we don't highlight them on the yep. show now, before we get to the main topic, we're going to stop by the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch, which those of you who listen to the podcast are going to miss out on. I guess you should have been here. We try to be here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your games nights better. But sometimes the real world just has other plans. So, yeah, tonight's question is, what's up? Uh, where have you guys been uh, in regarding to us? Well, there's been a number of things going on in Mo's life that have led us to have to cancel the last couple of we sh uh, weeks shows. While one was planned, the vacation that we warned everyone else about everyone, everything else has been totally unplanned. Yeah. So, so here's some kind of background. If it's going to be story time with Mo here. So after recording our show on August 23rd, that's the last episode we recorded. And again, we record live Wednesday nights live on Twitch. So after our live recording, I have the show came out. Um, we're chilling, Deanna and I on the couch, and there's a bad storm outside. It ended up it was a really bad storm outside, and we didn't quite realize just how bad it was um, until days after, and we saw the damage, and supposedly, I guess there was like a tornado in Essex County somewhere. Didn't affect us, but we're, we're here. Storm's like bad, but not horrible. We're in the basement, and we're watching TV, Netflix. I don't even remember what we were watching, and I hear this trickling sound, and I'm like, Deanna, I didn't even hear it. She's like, no, I don't hear it. And I hear this trickling sound. I kind of walk around. I don't see anything. Give it five more minutes after that, approximately. Um, I got up to go to the washroom or grab a snack or something. For whatever reason, I got up from the couch. And um, for anyone who doesn't know my basement, which is probably most of you, <laughs> um, the game room has like a little entertainment area, kind of like in an L shape. So you picture like my big game room, which most people have seen pictures online. Well, off to the left of that is this little area with the TV and the couch and stuff where we chill and do digital entertainment. 
and I'm cutting across the game room and I step in something wet and I look down and sure enough, we have water seeping in and it's currently coming out between a credenza, which is um, where I keep all our characters for RPGs and all my maps. It's got, you know, fold out drawers and one of the bookcases that has a mix of board game and role playing games on it. I'm like, oh, crap, we've got water coming in the basement. That's so one we of the run... worst things that gamers can can imagine yes. when they when their games are kept in the basement. Yes, exactly. So we have water coming in and it, it's seeping. Um, so we grab some towels, we throw down towels. Um, the first towels filled up pretty quick. Grab a second towel, throw that first one in the dryer. Um, and, and we seem to be managing it. So that night we kind of freak out a bit, but we're like, well, what are we going to do? It's at this point, probably 1 AM. I don't even know. Um, podcast nights, I'm usually wound up and I've drank too much coffee. So usually one or two in the morning or so it's, it's nighttime. And we're talking about it. And Deanna volunteered to sleep on the couch and set an alarm and get up every hour and swap the towels. Cause at this point we've determined like takes about an hour to soak a towel. So it's not like, you know, tons of water. We're not getting an inch of water in the game room, but it's enough coming in to be concerned about. So then the next day, it's Thursday, it storms again. And we're like, wow, this is terrible. So Thursday, more water's coming in. Um, As part of this, while we're kind of looking at it, at at this point, I move stuff, right? I, I slide an entire bookcase out of the way. Trust me, not easy when it's covered in thick RPG rule books um, and board games. But the RPG rule books, the heavy stuff. And I move that credenza out of the way and we get through the wall and I can figure out where it's seeping in. But the weird part, I don't know about weird or the bad part is we have w- window wells and there's a window that's over the credenza, which is why there's a credenza there instead of a bookshelf, because we didn't want to block the window. Well, that that wheel well is a fish tank. There's no fish in it, but it is filled to the brim with water. Um, pretty much up to the lip of our window. Like, give it another three millimeters, and I'd be able to see the water on the glass. It wasn't quite there. So this is a problem, obviously, and probably what's causing the leaking, but we don't know. So we went through this once before, 14 years ago. Um, I'm not sure when in the year. I know it was completed in October based on a Facebook memory. Yeah, thank you for Facebook memories for reminding us of some of the horrible times in our lives. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. So I get the memory of, yeah, yeah. So so in October, it was wrapping up. So I can't remember exactly when it happened 14 years ago. But similar situation, but except we were sitting there playing uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 3rd Edition, and I had my Monday night group over, and suddenly uh, Mike Murphy sitting there, he goes, what the hell, and his feet are wet. But that sept in, sept, is that the word? Seeped in? I don't know. The, whatever the, the, the past tense of seep is. Seeped in all around the walls, like everywhere. And, and it, like, uh, it got to be not an inch but like a couple centimeters of water and soaked our carpet and everything well back then when it happened we called a company i don't know if they're local or not i'm not going to name them but we called a water basement waterproofing company they um were like oh great we hear it yep yep you're you're guaranteed you're 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 covered under warranty or whatever um we'll be out as soon as we can well that wasn't until the next monday so here we are Going from Wednesday night to Monday, going I, I, like I'm watching for like hoping it doesn't rain, basically. Now, for anyone who's here for our last episode, we had announced we were leaving to go out of town up north to my uncle's farm in Campbellford, Ontario. But we were supposed to leave Sunday. So at this point, we're calling my uncle. We're canceling plans. We're we're um, we actually just didn't bother packing because we heard about it enough time ahead of time. And we're kind of like in a holding pattern going, well, uh, until advanced basement systems comes here, we don't want to leave. And there will should come out Monday. They didn't give us a time. So even Monday morning, we're like, we're going to go if advanced basement system comes in and fixes it by noon. If it takes more than noon, we're not going to go. We're going to go on Tuesday. So our whole vacation plan was a mess. So Monday... Advance, oh, sorry, the company comes. Sorry if I mentioned their name. You've already not said to. it three times. <laughs> Damn it. Sorry. Uh, well, okay. So they come out. This is, this is what happens when I don't have detailed show notes and I'm improv most of it, except for just uh, key points I wanted to mention. So so the company comes out. Uh, they take a look at it. Um, since I mentioned the name of the company, I will just say they they did what they could to fix the problem. Um, and gave us some information. 
and we think everything's done and good until the guy comes down and I'm at this point, everything's supposedly fixed. So I start moving things back. And when I'm moving things back, specifically uh, one of the, I had to move more bookshelves. I had to move four of them for them to check everything down there. So I'm pushing one of the, the bookshelves back and I kind of lean into the wall, like not heavy. I'm not bracing myself against it, but like my elbow kind of bumps the wall and it kind of mushes into it. And I'm like, oh, that can't be good. Not even a little bit. <laughs> not yeah. even a tiny little bit good. Yeah. Walls, walls should not mush. Now, again, I have a finished basement, so it's, it's, um, I think one quarter paneling with with a rocker board and then above it is drywall. And on that drywall is wallpaper that makes it look like a dungeon, right? Come on. So it's me and it's my game room. Well, we had checked the wall and touched the wall and nothing ever felt wet. None of the paneling felt wet. Nothing felt damp. The wallpaper even felt dry. But it ends up the drywall underneath seems to have been soaked. So I bring that up with the, the waterproofing company. The waterproofing company says, we don't do walls. We fixed our problem. You'll need to talk to insurance. So Monday, I finally call the insurance company. This one I'll remember not to mention. And we spend, I don't know, three days. I think it was three days waiting for phone calls, being told someone will call it. We were told someone will contact you within 24 hours. And I said, well, it's 1140 right now. So by noon tomorrow, someone will have called me. Yep, you'll hear from someone by noon tomorrow. At 2 p.m. that next day, I make a phone call going, I thought we were going to hear from someone. Eventually, we do get a phone call and they say, I am calling to let you know someone will call you. And I'm like, thanks. That's the way you, you, you check off your, we contacted someone within 24 hours. So we spent Tuesday, Wednesday, just waiting for calls and getting frustrated. Like it was just ridiculous. Eventually we talked to a contractor. It ends up they're from Aurelia because winds are so backed up because the storm was so bad. The whole region has flooded basements and water damage and rain damage and trees have fallen on people's houses. And yes, I get it. Like other people's damage was way worse than ours. We had some seeping water, but we still need someone out. And we just dealt with the frustration of, and this is something I didn't know. I guess contractors are given a, a quota or no, a limit that they're allowed to take, a number of insurance cases they're allowed to take. And once they hit that, they can't take any more. And when they can't, that case gets sent to the Insurance Board of Canada, who then assigns it to a different contract. I, I had never heard of this. So well, I, th we I think the real reason we haven't heard of this is just because the the number of problems that were happening all at once. Like I, the, the yeah. these storms um, were were staggering. Uh, at one point, it felt like I was at a, one of my rock shows. Uh, <laughs> there was so much lightning; it was literally just strobing yeah. in the sky constantly. Um, these storms were something else, and so absolutely, there were a lot of people throughout. The, the Windsor Essex County region who uh, had damage from, from, yeah. you know, relatively minor damage, which isn't actually even all that minor when you're, when your walls are, uh, are, are going smush. That's not, uh, that's not really small damage all the yeah. way up to, I'm sure people who had, you know, things cave in and damage from high winds and hail and other mm. storm effects that were happening. Uh, what's really bizarre also though is that because of this, it really makes Windsor feel a little bit backwater. I mean, Windsor yeah. is not. Windsor is a significant metropolitan area uh, that has a lot of services, except it really didn't feel like it during no. this whole sequence. No, I agree. And just this whole quota system, like, like I, I, we got screwed around. Like, like that's, I can't say it any other way. We'd have a contractor call and they say, okay, we're going to have someone out. I'm like, okay, when? We're going to have someone out by 10 a.m. And I'm like, okay, fine. Okay, we're going to have someone out by 10 a.m., but we won't start the work till next week. Oh, awesome. Okay, everyone start packing. We're actually going to get to go up to, to my uncle's. Then 10 a.m., nothing happens. 11 a.m., nothing happens. At noon, I'm like, I make the phone call. What's going on? Oh, we've chosen not to take on your case because we fit your quota. Like, no one was going to call us? No one was going to tell us that? Then a day goes by before we hear from anyone again. Like it was stuff like that. I'm not going to get into all the little details, but like, so eventually what we did was Thursday morning, we said F it and went on vacation. Cause at this point 
no additional damage is going to happen and no one's going to be able to fix it no matter what. So we just like, forget it. This is ridiculous. We're heading out of town. Let's, let's at least try to scavenge, salvage some of what's left. No, we are leaving Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so five days later than we were supposed to. Like it was supposed to be more than a week out of town and we cut it down to a long weekend, basically. So finally, someone calls us Tuesday. This is Tuesday after Labor Day at this point, all a day before two weeks since the damage happened to tell us they're, we're going to have someone out Wednesday. <laughs> So finally, we have a contractor in our house the Wednesday after two weeks after the damage happened. They look at it. They say, yep, that is wet drywall. Um, <laughs> yes, that needs to come down. Shockingly, shockingly uh, intense observations yes. there. Yes, yes, that wet yes. drywall is wet drywall. Yes. That is wet drywall. Um, um, I it. They look at a bunch of other stuff. They take a bunch of measurements. They talk about it. And, and they keep insisting I should be starting to cut stuff down. And every time I, they say that, I say, but the problem is, if I start doing the work, it's not guaranteed by the insurance company. It's only guaranteed if the insurance company sends someone in. And the guy's like, well, I know I don't know anything about your coverage. And then I try to get him to give me an estimate. He won't do that because he's I know nothing about your coverage. And I just keep being told that I, 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 I know nothing about your coverage. He's like, if you want, I can have guys in here tonight and we can get working on this. But if it ends up you're not covered, you're going to pay five to six thousand dollars in fees, including me getting fined for working out of my jurisdiction because this person is not from Windsor. And you'd have to cover that. Because I'm not supposed to work in Windsor right now. And I'm like, well, no, I'm not going to do that. So at this point, no, I still haven't heard from my insurance company. So this guy actually leaves. He ends up coming back on Thursday to figure out the extent of the damage, and it ends up way worse than we thought. We thought it was just the drywall under the window well. Meanwhile, it's basically one half of an entire wall going around a corner. Um, for those who know my game room, I think it was six bookshelves worth of space that we had. Yeah, sadly, drywall out. wicks. Huh. Yes. Yeah, but he said it wouldn't wick around the corner, so he's actually concerned that there might be a problem with the foundation on that side of the house. Mm. But I won't see it until my guys come in and start tearing things apart. So finally, days later, until Tuesday, this week, a.k.a. yesterday. So we're now at three we, weeks since the storms. Yes. We finally hear from an insurance adjuster. It ends up my desk adjuster had changed, which I had no idea. They were shocked we hadn't heard from the desk adjuster, but here we have the field adjuster. He comes in. He's great. He's he's the typical nice. And I, I, from what I hear, this is a Canadian experience, not a U.S. experience, but the nice, happy. Oh, my God, this is terrible for you. We'll get on it right away. We got to get something done. Happy go lucky insurance industrial. When the insurance is like, yes, this is under your claim. We will cover it and we're going to do everything we can. So you leave us a positive review in the end or whatever the hell. Why? 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 Some insurance companies are so happy. This is not a I'm trying to find any excuse that we don't have to pay this out. The thing is, this guy is the um, field adjuster and not the desk adjuster and can't make a call. It's the desk adjuster who finally determines if uh, we qualify. So this guy does his his inspection. He does make a note that that he's not allowed to say so, but there's no reason this won't be covered for us, which is good to hear. So that was like the first good news of all of this. But then goes, now I'll send off my report and you'll probably hear back in about two weeks. We've been told by the desk people to say two weeks at a minimum. So here we are. Um, it's now been three weeks. Um, and, and, and we were waiting for a phone call from our desk adjuster living with wet walls that probably at this point are already turning to mold if they weren't already. So. And, 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 and as a bigger problem, I, I you know, everyone uh, who's watching the show tonight and, and, and watching this on YouTube can see that Mo is back up in his office, no longer down yeah. in the studio, which was next to wet drywall. But yeah. also the amount of reorganization and, and shifting in an already rather cramped house with five people in it uh -huh. has just gotten a lot worse as they sit around and wait with space cleared for contractors to come in and eventually do something. something. Um, 
But again, there, there's a whole lot of unusable space that had to be emptied out in a cramped living environment. Yeah. So that, so yeah, that, that, that was going to be my next point. Cause while all this was going on is we emptied out half my game room. So I have no game room. Um, I have no game table. It currently is pushed off into a corner and has all the chairs that are normally around it sitting on top of it. Um, the studio is gone, right? We, we were so excited this year. We we're going to have a new studio and we built a studio in the basement, including like mounting some stuff from the ceilings. Um, that all had to get taken down. Um, we talked about last week when stuff was half done, possibly recording down there. But the one thing the contractor was very clear on was heck no, don't use that outlet that's on the wall that's wet. So that's where everything plugged in. Um, my front room has game stacks that are about as tall as I am. Uh, for anyone who follows me on Instagram, I've shared a couple pictures and videos of what things look like around here right now. And um, it's a mess. So uh, like, so what we've done, uh, as you can tell, we are live tonight. So what I did is I hooked up a webcam I hooked up my uh, my microphone and I managed to use a boom arm to attach it to a bookshelf over there. But like, I don't have lights up here at this point. Um, to be fair, one of the lights is behind me. But while we were packing things up, I have no idea where the cord went. Um, the second big LED light, I think, is somewhere in the front room, probably buried. Um, we're using my old computer. So the quality of my video is not to the level it used to be. Um, so what we can do now and what I hope we'll continue to do on Wednesdays is we will still record a show. Just the video quality is going to be what you see tonight and not what um, we had gotten used to with the new studio. Yep. Now, what you're not going to see probably are things like unboxing videos, because that is actually the biggest part of the studio downstairs. I had set up a three camera setup just specifically for doing unboxing videos in um, high def that also had like a green screen effect so I could show close-ups and all that. Well, all that's gone. Like it's, it's here. Uh, there's a pile. I don't know if people can see it over here that has some of the boom arms and the cameras and the power bar. Um, but this PC can't handle all of that technology. No, it can't. So the, the new PC is literally sitting here beside me. I can put my, I can touch it from where I'm sitting. So there's, I don't know. I, I, it's going to be two weeks before we even hear from someone who knows how many weeks or months the work's going to take. Maybe I'll end up hooking up this PC up here. Now we had to buy a UPS for it anyway, which we were going to do to put in downstairs because we didn't have one yet. Maybe I put a second UPS under my desk. I use the second plug that's in this back wall and I have two PCs up here and I switch to which one we're using to record. Um, I don't think I'm going to go so far as to mount the camera like I did. So it was hovering before. Um, and I have no idea if that'll lead to unboxings, but maybe we'll switch to using it. But like the whole problem is we don't know uh, that this happened three weeks ago, three weeks ago today after recording, we had water in our house. It's been three weeks and we still don't know what's happening. So I, I it's been very frustrating. And unfortunately, because the game room has been packed up and, and blocked off and, and reorganized, that leads to other things as well for those in the Windsor area. This weekend is our uh, weekly board gaming or monthly board gaming event in the area. And uh, what games are going to go may depend on what games are simply accessible to us, yeah. let alone, uh, you know, which which we might have chosen to play otherwise. <laughs> yeah. So so one of the things we were pretty good about while we were moving stuff into the front room was to leave the pile of obligation games out. The stuff I've already unboxed that we've been playing or uh, so that we can continue to review stuff. So things like Castle Panic, um, which we still haven't done a formal review on, Boop. Um, actually, I don't know what Boop, so I got to double check. Boop, Night not be. Kapow was one. Distilled, we made sure was out. Um, so some of the obligation games I made sure are out and available. Um, but when when are we going to uh, get to play them? I don't know. Like I... I have a dining room table. We technically could sit at my dining room table and play, but that often is, you know, the kids are doing homework or whatever. Um, the other thing is, and we haven't even gotten into this here, is normally we game on Sundays over at Brenda's house, Deanna's mom. 
Um, and we play family games over there. And that's like we try to play our games with different uh, groups of people. And part of it is playing with them. Well, we can't do that now because they got it way worse than we did. Like we're talking a foot of water. Yeah, they had her- flooding, not seeping. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they, they like a foot of water in her very finished basement, like like even more finished than ours. <laughs> ours is a little rough. Right. But it's just tile floor, you know, where she had, you know, wood panel floor. And uh, I, like, I feel bad for Brenda. But for the same reason, we don't have a game room. She doesn't have a kitchen table now because everything from her basement had to come up. And literally there, everything, every piece of furniture, everything that was in this large finished basement had to come upstairs somewhere. And, and a large chunk of that is taking up the area we would game. So getting games played is going to be rough. So what I will say, is we're good for a few weeks We're we're good uh, probably for the next two, three shows um, just because of stuff we've already brought out and already played stuff. I played with dice and logo stuff. Sean and I have played stuff. We brought to the last barbershop bar event. Like we have enough stuff that we can review. Like I've got plans for next week and the week after, but after that uh, we might be back down to one review. I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. This could go on for months. I, I no idea. So that is uh, where we've been, what's been going on, and why we uh, took a little extra unexpected time off from the podcast. But we are still here and still trying to make sure we have content for you, for the publishers, and for everyone who enjoys our content. Yeah, I got to have a big shout out to um, some of the publishers we deal with and their understanding on this. Um, I, I'll call them out. Uh, in particular, the Mysterious Package Company and Unidragon. Uh, there's a reason we're reviewing two of their games tonight. They we don't often accept timed, time sensitive review content because of the fact we try to play games five times with different groups of people and so on. There's a lot that goes behind the reviews. It t- it's not a nice quick bang hammered out in one week kind of thing for us. I don't tend to accept anything with a time limit unless it's a couple months out. Now, I made an exception for these two two particular companies because they were puzzle-style games and the fact that, that we don't need to do that, right? I don't need to play it five times. I just need to sit down one evening, maybe two or three, sit down and play them. I saw no reason we wouldn't have been able to get these things reviewed on time for their release dates, their 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 target dates. That's a, that's a proper word I'm looking for. And they were both so understanding when I got a hold of them and said, Look, I don't know. <laughs> like these were both supposed to be on last week's recording. Well, we didn't record last week. Um, like I, I, I'm like I don't know when I can get this live. I, I have flooding, and they were both very understanding. Now you'll know, uh, kind of backwards from our usual thing. The two reviews are live on the blog. If you got get our newsletter, I already linked to them, so you can kind of get a preview of what we're going to talk about later, um, on tonight and tonight's episode. Um. But I, I do have to give big props to those two com- companies in particular, as well as others we're working with. Um, Escape World is very impatient for me to unbox the next thing they sent. They're very excited about it. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I, I, I want to do it justice. I don't want to unbox it sitting here in my office. I'd rather do it somewhere that we can um, can show things off a little better. But maybe to that end, maybe at the, during the after show tonight, we'll do some unpackagings because at least then I can get some stuff open. Uh, now, what I might do is reach out to a couple companies and say, hey, is it okay if we review your game without an unboxing? Because we did promise an unboxing to all these people because that, that's the big thing we're going to miss out on. But anyway, sorry, I'm rambling. Like I said before, this is what happens when I when I have <laughs> uh, unscripted show. Mo likes to ramble. So, yeah, uh, flooded basement. There's other stuff going on, but that's the big thing. Uh, flooded basement, back to school, uh, kids. I, I'm a, one of my kids is starting co-op, so she's starting a job um, tomorrow. And and the school has screwed up and not given us bus passes. And people have gone through some minor illnesses. And Dana's sister-in-law is really not doing well. And there's just all this stuff going on. But the big reason we weren't live last week is a flooded basement. And that's why I look like I do here and I'm recording upstairs. And yes, that's going to impact some of our future content. But we're going to do the best we can do. So thank you, everyone who uh, puts up with our unplanned (laughs) uh, life impacting changes to the show. Uh, We try to be as consistent as we can, and sometimes it doesn't work. All right. Well, if you have a question for us for our regular shows, 
Hit us up with an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to the blog and click on Ask the Bellhop. Welcome to a preview of the first Body of Evidence game, something new from Mysterious Package Company. So before we get started, I need to be very clear that the copy of Body of Evidence Best Serve Cold that we were sent is a prototype copy. Mysterious Package Company was very clear that pretty much everything we got in the box, and not all of it even fit in the box, we that we received was a placeholder for something that would both look and possibly more importantly, feel better. The quality of the components would be significantly better than what we had. Also, the copy of Body of Evidence that we received was delivered in the middle of a huge storm Thursday. Uh, the day after we recorded last week, for those of you who were paying attention in the last segment. And as far as I can tell, it was dropped off while we were taking cover during a tornado warning. And we didn't find the box until the next morning, and it was so true. That said, Mo and his family were successfully able to play the game. Nothing yeah. was completely ruined except for some faded text. Everything was still usable. Though it sometimes stuck together a little more than we had hoped. Now, Best Served Cold is the first game and what should be a new series of murder mystery games from Mysterious Package Company. Now, the series of games is going to be called the Body of Evidence series of games. And what makes this series unique and where the name comes from is that you not only get to play detective in these games to try to solve the case, you also get to be the lead coroner. So this is a tabletop investigation game for one to four players with a playtime of two to three hours. The game is broken into three parts, which means you can either play it all the way through at once or stop between stages. Now, the age rating on this is 14 plus. Now, what you're not going to find here is gore or blood or overly descriptive um, descriptions of violence or, or harm. It does involve a murder and you are going to be performing a mock autopsy on a paper cadaver as part of the game. Body of Evidence Best Served Cold is currently live on Kickstarter and has smashed through its initial goal on the first day. There is only one pledge level at $50 Canadian or $35 US, which I've been told is $10, 10% 10 off what the retail cost will be. Now in Best Served Cold, you're going to take on the role of a police detective or team of investigators investigating the recent death of a popular local chef. Now, currently, the cause of death is listed as accidental, but suspicions have been raised that there's something more to the case. You're going to sift through three different evidence piles to try to deduce six key elements of the case, including things like the cause of death and who the perpetrator is, if there is one. Now, during each step, you're also going to have to complete an autopsy on the victim's corpse. All of this evidence is divided up into three case folders. Inside each, you will uh, find a variety of things, such as pictures of the victim's belongings, where the body was found, a map of the restaurant, witness statements, suspect interviews, and other clues. There is also a coroner's guidebook that walks you through how to do the autopsy part of the game. With that, you also get a surprisingly large, fold-out, multi-layered paper body. Now, in case it's not obvious from that description, you are going to be destroying components of this game as you play it. Now, this includes cutting up the paper body, but as well as that, you're going to be writing in the logbook, and there's a time chart to fill out, and there's other places where you're probably going to write things down. Now, unlike many other puzzle games, I can't really see a way to preserve Best Serve Cold to pass it on to someone else when you're done. The Kickstarter page does note, we care about waste and sometimes... A deductive mystery can only be experienced once. That's why we've included a full instruction kit so that you can re-gift your copy to a friend or loved one. Though I can't see quite how that would work with cutting up the paper body. Yeah, I, I have no idea. So our prototype copy didn't include an instruction kit on how to re-gift it. So I can't really see how it works. Like, I, I don't know how you're going to reconstruct that body, but... It'll be interesting to see once the final game is produced. And I got to say, it's nice to see a company saying, hey, re-gift this when you're done. That's nice that they recognize that people do that. So let's get into how this new style of murder mystery game works. So Body of Evidence Best Surf Cold comes with an instruction book that, you know, the front of it looks like a cold storage cabinet at the morgue, which is a nice touch. 
Now in it, you're gonna find your instructions how to play, but actually what's gonna jump out at you first, quite literally, is a set of feet and a toe tag. And I gotta say, that was a great intro to the game. That was a great onboarding to go, hey, this is what this game's about, and this is what it's gonna feel like. It did a great job setting the mood of the game immediately. This book walks you through how to get through all three sections of the case, which are independent from each other. Before you move on from one to the next, you will need to find the answers to two questions about the case. Then at the end, you will take all the information you have and answer a final series of questions. It will take combining the information from both the physical evidence and the autopsy to answer the final questions that solve the mystery. Now, once you think you have everything figured out, there is a red sealed package to open up that not only gives you the final solution and tells you who done it, but also gives you a bunch of other information, which the most interesting part was this is stuff you could have discovered about the case that you may or may not have. Now, in each section of Best Served Cold, each of the, the different evidence envelopes or uh, folders, you're going to be presented with a set of evidence pertinent to that part of the investigation. You're also going to read through a section of the coroner's guidebook, which will walk you through and complete a part of the autopsy. To make sure you're on the right track, the game comes with a set of evidence cards. Once you have an answer, you find the appropriate card and match it up with the cards you already have. The cards are designed to look like an investigation corkboard complete with red threads. When placing your evidence cards, if the threads match up, you're on the right track. If they don't, you will need to go back to the evidence and figure out what you've missed. Now, what you're not going to find in Body of Evidence is any other form of clue system. The cards tell you if you're right or wrong, but they don't actually give you hints to get you to that point or point you towards where you made a mistake. Now, that said, I don't think clues are really needed here. This isn't really a puzzle game. While there are a couple of puzzle elements to the autopsy, this isn't some kind of escape room in a box game that needs a detailed hint system. This is more of a murder mystery where you're looking at evidence and putting clues together. Now, you played this one with Deanna and her mom. What did you guys think? I didn't know what to expect when I signed up to review, uh, preview, sorry, Body of Evidence, Best Served Cold. Uh, like, Mysterious Package Company was like, do you want to check out our new game? We're doing something new. And that's about it. And I asked, I said, well, the other game of yours we're reviewing ended up being a little disturbing to my kids and i'm wondering um how family friendly is this and they said well this one's 14 plus but there's no graphic descriptions of violence so we're not sure but they never even told me that i was going to find a large paper body inside this and get to play corner so that was a bit of a shock now the other game we have checked out from them is the ghost in the machine now that's part of their post-modern mortem sorry post-mortem london gothic series and that's my only experience I've had with that company. So I was expecting something like that. Now, Ghost in the Machine is kind of like a really deluxe which way book, actually two which way books, where you're going through the case in a first person story of you being the investigator and making choices. And when you unlock certain parts of evidence, you get like an actual evidence bag, and you open it up and it's much more like a which way book with a lot of actual physical evidence for you to hold, like, you know, like a drinking flask and like big chunky pieces. That's absolutely nothing like Best Served Cold. Best Served Cold is a totally different style game. Thankfully, it was only a paper body. The deluxe upgrade kit for this one would cost a fortune in shipping. So what this one reminds me of is um, that we reviewed in the past was the Hidden Games Crime Scene Games. Uh, it reminded me of those. Now, like there is some great physicality to the game, but it's basically a bunch of paper, right? It's a, it, it, It's pictures. And it's witness statements and it's maps and it's 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 paper things. Right. And solving the case is mostly about reading, reading comprehension and sifting through papers and putting the facts on them and corroborating and things like that. The thing is, this evidence sifting is combined with that whole be a corner thing, which is is the new thing. This is the new, interesting, fascinating new bit. And it's very cool and quite well done. There is a level immersion of immersion here with you actually cutting through layers of paper and peeling things back and out of the way and later having to remove paper organs that, that I've never experienced in a murder mystery game or really any 
board game form or tabletop form before. This really takes those early years games of operation you had up <laughs> to the next level. Yeah, there's no buzzing nose when you when you missed up here, unfortunately. That, that maybe that'll be a Kickstarter exclusive. You can get the buzzing nose version of uh, Body of Evidence. Uh, the other thing, though, that was kind of cool is they managed to do this while being uh, tasteful, I guess is the right word. Like, it's not gory or gross. There's literally no blood here. I, our kids had no interest in taking part in this. Like once we told them what it was and what's about, we gave them the option. You can come, you can play with us, but you're going to do this. Now, both my kids are old enough. They've done dissections in, in science class. They're familiar with the concept and they know what an autopsy is, but they weren't interested in all. But I got to say, having played through it, I think they would have been fine if they had been there. Like they weren't even present. So we couldn't be like, hey, kids, come check it out. I think they would have been OK. Well, it's still probably to go better to go with less squeamish people if you are going to be playing this game. Um, my only real disappointment, though, uh, was that immersion, that immersion of uh, you're cutting into a cadaver and looking for clues is once you actually got to the clues, the actual organs and that uh, just. Well, some of it was well done, some at least felt realistic. So uh, the body has a bruise on it. And you're given a chart and you have to hold the chart up to the bruise and match the color, which leads you to a clue, which is that that seems like something you probably do as a corner. No, I'm not a corner. nor do I play one on TV, nor have I ever played one in a role playing game. But I'm guessing that's the kind of thing you do is compare bruise colors. But other parts were just gamified. Like there was a point where you play connect the dots with some dots on a lung. I'm pretty sure no corner out there is playing connect the dots. Though I suppose they really do need to find some reason to justify this physical disassembly, and frankly, autopsy tests just generally aren't that exciting. Uh, yeah. Waiting around for lab results makes for a really boring puzzle game. <laughs> yes, that would be funny if you open up the package and says, okay, put the game away and come back a week later <laughs> to get your results. Uh, that would make me laugh. There's a level of immersion I haven't seen in one of these games. Um, now, one of the things I did appreciate about this case was the fact it was broken into three distinct parts with uh, the pretty much standalone. Uh, we managed to complete the entire game in one sitting, but there was no reason for that. Um, it did take us about three hours, uh, but we could have stopped, packed the whole thing up and then easily picked it up again on another day. Um, I do appreciate that. Yeah, that's always a benefit of these games. Chapters, natural breaks, folders, what have you. Uh, not only can some people not afford to all that time at once, but things can interfere even if you were planning on setting aside all that time. Yeah. And it's nice to be able to pause and, and know that the game has allowed for that. Now, one thing I did want to call out because it wasn't entirely clear in the instructions uh, is that when you get down to your final answer, uh, they're very clear about each section of the puddle isn't needed for the next. Well, when you get to the final answer, you kind of need all the pieces. Uh, it was a minor thing, but like we had packed up each chapter as we completed it, especially because like I said there was some damage to our particular version of it. Uh, again, not the publisher's fault, but there was some damage there and we just kind of pushed stuff out of the side. Thankfully, we didn't throw anything away. Um, so I, we 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 had to um, dig some of the stuff back out at the end. Now, this is something um, while doing this for Mysterious Package Company, they did have me fill out a form at the end with feedback. So this is one of the things I pointed out to just be more clear of this. I mean, notes are a vital aspect of doing any autopsy. They've always got those, you know, microphones over top so you yeah. can record all your all the gory details as you've got your hands in the body. Uh, apparently, you just weren't good enough at the uh, coroner's job. Yeah, maybe that was it. Maybe that was it. Now, I will say the way it was written to three parts, though, did make the game feel very linear. Um, best serve cold does a lot of hand holding as you work through the case. Now, this is especially true of the autopsy part. And I think this is probably because this is their first game trying this out. This whole autopsy system's new to them and they're not sure how people will, will approach it. There wasn't a lot of exploration or discovery. It was the coroner's guard guide basically said, look at the body for things like bruises. And you're like, yeah, well, there's a bruise and look for this. Make a small incision here, but don't cut. You should see something that looks like this. Did you see something that looks like this? Now do that. And and like it literally walked you through stage by stage. It, it almost felt like building a model more. Well, I guess deconstructing a model 
um, more than trying to like investigate and, and, and solve things. Now I'm not saying this is bad, but being this linear, like, like it does help that you can't get lost. And an important part in this one is you're not going to places you shouldn't go to yet, I guess, as a way to, to the, you're, you're not like, as soon as you open this up, you want to kind of cut into the chest cavity. Well, it walks you through it a little slower than that. And that's not, actually doesn't happen until chapter two, or maybe that was, no, I think that was chapter three, right? But it does mean I, I found there was a loss of that sense of exploration that you expect in these kind of games. And it also made it harder for different people to work on different parts. Like you couldn't really split up the autopsy thing and go like, well, you go check out, you know, this area and you check out this area didn't work because it was very much go here, do this, look for this. Did you see this? Yep, you saw that. OK, do that. I mean, I, first off, it is the potentially first game in a new series. Yeah. So it will be interesting to see if this game becomes the starter kit and future mm. games offer less handholding to people who have played previous games. Perhaps, a, you know, a, a guy open this if you've never played one of these uh, body of evidence games before. But at the mm -hmm. other time, as I, you know, as I'm listening to this, autopsies are done very by the books. Like, yeah. The first thing you do is you examine the the exterior of the body and you do yep. this and this and this. And only then, after all this is done, do you cut into the chest and do this, this and this. I mean, autops it's, it's, autopsies are not an exploratory thing. It's a very step by step process. Uh, so in that way, it you know, that part of it is kind of actually a little on yeah. the accurate side. Uh, you're you're not supposed to go digging around in there to see what you find. Now, the non-corner part, though, was less structured. It allowed for more exploration, discovery. Um, there were some great red herrings, uh, interesting twists. Uh, it did a great job of making you suspect one thing at the start of the game. Like, you're going to start off, you're going to be, just like when you're watching a, a murder mystery on TV, you're going to be like, oh, I know what this is. It's going to be this. Watch, I called it now. Uh, no, it wasn't that, right? <laughs> and, and it was kind of like every chapter had its own twist. And just introduced enough evidence to be like, ha, huh, we got you. It's not that. It's something else. Uh, the overall story was solid and engaging. Um, it was filled with interesting characters. And I've got to say the characters felt real and relatable. They, this sounded like something, a bunch of employees at a restaurant and they're, they're, what was going on and the backstory and everything you discovered seemed very re realistic. It was, calling, it was very well written. I'm calling it now. It was badly prepared blowfish. Yes. Uh, so it de definitely, it seems like the investigative part, they certainly know they've got yeah. that part of it. And they, I, I mean, this is not their first uh, detective mystery game. No. So they've really dialed that in. So primarily it's uh, how you experience the coroner's portion of the game that really seems to be where they're not struggling, but exploring and trying yeah. to find the best way forward. Uh, now, the game was recommended one to four. Um, we played it with three, as mentioned. Uh, that seemed about right. Uh, I would say in general, we mainly played with two. Deanna and her mom did the bulk of the work, and I, I, I was mainly there to take pictures and kind of record some observations because it's more their kind of game than mine. Um, I think you're going to want two. I, I wouldn't recommend playing this with one for the same reason we recommend two for every puzzle, escape room in a box, mystery, clue game, is you want a different perspective on things. You want another set of eyes. You want another brain there that will think about things different than you. Um, with two. With more than two, you can work together and split the work. Um, I can definitely see, uh, especially with two people or more, splitting the physical evidence while the, another person works on the autopsy. Uh, though I think most groups are going to want to do with us and kind of do it together just to experience it. But it, they're, they're very clearly distinct. The sifting through physical evidence and the autopsy, one's reading through a book doing one thing while the other's trying to fill out a, a timesheet. Uh, not timesheet, but a time tracker. And you could very easily split that work. And even with the um, the time tracker, there's lots of multiple pieces of evidence. So I could definitely see you passing around like here you read. I'm going to make up names here. Joe's witness statement. You read Carol's witness statement and then we'll get together at the end and corroborate the two. You could definitely split it up that way. So I guess realistically, uh, if you do have screen screenish people and like your kids, uh, they could have gone off and done the physical evidence and yeah. uh, the autopsy could have been performed in a separate room uh, away from uh, anyone who might be disturbed by such things. Yeah, true. Uh, we didn't think of it at the time, but yeah, I don't, there, w there was not, a, this was one of the complaints actually Deanna had with the game is, is they felt almost like two different games. 
And while you're combining the, the, the results, the answers from both, neither one relied on the other. Like, I don't think there was anything. Oh, no, there was a bit of overlap. Like, I can think of one particular piece of evidence on the body that was described in the witness statements. But in general, they almost felt like two separate games. So, yeah, there's almost no reason you couldn't go to the other room, do the autopsy, come back in. Uh, overall, I, I was impressed. I, this is a, a, a neat experience, a body of evidence, best served cold. Like, I, I haven't done a lot of murder mystery games. Again, I mentioned they're, they're more uh, my mother-in-law and my, my wife enjoy these. Deanna and her mom like them more than me. I prefer the puzzle games. I, I like the, the, the escape room in a box style games more than these. But I got to say, what I really liked was the whole corner thing, right? Like, the, the whole point of the series, the body of evidence series, is going to getting to play coroner as well as detective. And I got to say, that's a neat addition to the tabletop investigation game genre. So if you enjoy whodunit, murder mystery, cold case file style games, you will love Body of Evidence Best Served Cold. It includes all of the stuff you know and love from this style of game and then tosses in an entirely new level by having you play coroner as well as investigator. Now, for those of you who've never tried one of these tabletop investigation games, I got to say, Body of Evidence, Best Served Cold is a pretty good place to start uh, because of the way the investigation is broken into three parts, that there's a very clear linear progression to how the clues are presented. And it very clearly tells you what you should be looking for in each part. It very clearly says you are looking for these two answers to these two questions before you progress. You know exactly what you're looking for. I think it makes a great introduction to the murder mystery game genre. Well, if sifting through evidence, reading witness reports, and spotting things in photographs isn't your thing, you'll probably want to skip Body of Evidence. This is very much a murder mystery investigation game and not a series of puzzles or an escape room in a box experience. Like, say, uh, La Famiglia or another puzzle, which is another puzzle game we reviewed in the past. Yeah, this game also isn't for anyone who's turned off by the idea of pretending to cut into a cadaver. The autopsy is a major part of this game, and I suggest it will be in every body of evidence game. This is not something you can skip over or avoid, though Sean did mention you could do it separate from a main group if you've got some squeamish people in your group. If this isn't for you, if you're not into cutting up bodies, that, that sounded terrible, um, to invest in uh, completing autopsies, if you're not into cleaning autopsies, I encourage you to check out the other investigation games over at Mysterious Package Company. As Sean mentioned earlier, they really have nailed the whole investigation genre. Um, if you do go there to go pick up any of these games, you can use our exclusive code BELLHOP to save 10% off any already discounted or full price. Do you enjoy tabletop investigation games? Do you love sifting through clues, sorting evidence, comparing reports, and eventually solving crimes? Have you ever wanted to dive deeper and get to play the coroner as well? Or is that a step too far for you and your game group? Let us know in the comments below. I got to say, just sharing pictures of the game on X, there were a lot of people who were like, what is this? I need it now. So there's definitely people interested in diving into that part of investigation. Now, I also want to invite you to join the Tabletop Bellhop Discord. You can find that at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. That's a great place to talk about any of the games we reviewed, including this one. Finally, if you want to know more about Best Served Cold and want to see some of the prototype components we were sent, check out my Body of Evidence Best Served Cold review on the blog. It is live now, so head over once you're done listening. There's a new Quezzel coming. Thank you for joining us for an early look at Quezzel Space Adventures, a new mashup of quest and puzzle that's got more, a lot more game elements than the original. Quezzle Space Adventures is a new mashup of puzzle and tabletop game from wooden puzzle company Unidragon. This is the second game in the Quezzle series, with the first being Quezzle Amazing Cappadocia. For more information on the original Quezzle, check out our Quezzle Amazing Cappadocia review from back in February of 2022. Links in the show notes or click up here. This new outer space themed Quezzle was successfully funded on both Indiegogo and Kickstarter and due to hit retail in two days on September 15th, 2023. This game has you embark on a mission to four different regions of the galaxy, each owned by a different faction. 
You're going to start off by building your spaceships, then set out to explore the galaxy by building a 1,000-piece wooden jigsaw puzzle. From there, you're going to visit each faction and complete quests to unlock a clue from each. You're then going to use these clues to unlock a cryptex, which will lead you to the villain. What happens next? You're going to have to play through and find out. Unlike the original Quezzle game, Quezzle Space Adventures is a single, standalone game which comes in a single, rather large, wooden box. Inside it, you will find the jigsaw puzzle pieces, a cryptex, a logbook that guides you through the game, and a picture of the completed puzzle with hints on the back. You will also come across a number of wooden punch boards for things like disc shooting spaceships, dice, targets, and more. Now, the quality of everything here, starting right from the box itself, is fantastic. The puzzle pieces are made of thick laser-cut wood and are painted with bright, clear graphics. The puzzle pieces fit together perfectly, though we did find the 3D ships were sometimes hard to assemble. You may want a rubber mallet on hand to get any stubborn bits to slot together. Now, a nice touch that's new in this version of Quezzle is that many of the items on the images are also textured and have an added slight three-dimensional element to them. Now, I have absolutely no complaints about the quality of this puzzle at all. Unidragon makes some of the best wooden puzzles in the world, and Quezzle, this new version, is of that same high quality that I've come to expect from them. Well, enough about what's in the box. How do we use all of this stuff? So Quezzle Space Adventures is much more than just a jigsaw puzzle. The tabletop game aspects of this experience start right with opening the box. To even get Quezzle Space Adventures box open, you have to solve four word puzzles, then turn the rocket ship dials on the box lid to the proper letters. Now, the next step after you sift through all the cool bits and marvel at the uniquely shaped pieces is to grab the logbook. This will lead you through the story, which has you complete a number of tasks, which start by building four 3D disc shooting spaceships. Once you have your ships and have finished playing around shooting at the targets and each other with them, you move on to building the jigsaw puzzle. So this features a 1000 piece jigsaw puzzle that's going to take you some time to build. The overall image for the puzzle has a ton of tiny little detail and the puzzle pieces all come in interesting and intricate shapes. Like all Unidragon's puzzles, the big part of the fun here is how they have worked in thematic shapes into the puzzle. While putting together this puzzle, you'll just find pieces in all sorts of shapes of spaceships, telescopes, ray guns, aliens, robots, and more. Now, once the puzzle's built, the next step is to grab the logbook again and use it to explore each of the four quadrants of the puzzle. Now, you can do these in any order, which is a nice bit of exploration. Now, the quests in each quadrant have you looking for things across the entire puzzle. For example, in the Happy Republic, we had to collect pieces of a prototype which consisted of three lab crates and a number of vials. As you spot these items, you actually pull them out of the puzzle. Once you've collected a complete set, you combine the pieces to form a mini puzzle. Each completed mini puzzle gives you a clue you'll need to solve the overall game. Now, in addition, each quadrant's quest ends with a simple mini game. Uh, these include things like tic-tac-toe, odds and evens, building them, rolling dice to see who rolls higher, and a shooting game that uses those 3D ships you built earlier. And I can't help but noticing that this game is the opposite of Voltron. Rather than five yes. little mini puzzles combining to create one, you've got one giant puzzle decombining to create five mini, uh, mini puzzles. Yes, uh, yes it is. Once you I collect the four, clues from all you know, four factions, you'll be able to open up the cryptex. That will lead you to the next step. Oh, uh, we don't want to spoil the fun. So I think we're going to stop right there and let you discover the end of Quezzle Space Adventures on your own. So early we noted that this is actually a follow-up to Quezzle Amazing Cappadocia, which we reviewed in 2022. And I think it's worth taking a bit of time to compare these two quest puzzles. All right. So the first big difference is this is one box. This is a single box, one big 1000 piece puzzle as opposed to four separate 250 piece puzzles. What this also means is there's just one thing to buy instead of the weird model where you bought box one and then you were encouraged to buy the other boxes. All that mess is gone. You buy this, you get the whole thing at once. 
Now, being one big puzzle, that does mean that the puzzle part of Quizzle Space Adventures was much more difficult than any of the individual Quizzle Amazing Cappadocia boxes. Now, the other big change here is in regards to clarity. The entire game aspect of Amazing Cappadocia was not really clear. I know multiple people who thought they had discovered all the game had to offer only to read our review and find out we were missing out on half the game. Space Adventures doesn't have that problem. What you need to do, when to do it, and in what order is very clear and all tracked right in that logbook. Now, we might even go so far as to say too clear. You are handheld through every step of the adventure here. While this is better than getting completely stumped or lost, that comes at the expense of the uh, sense of discovery and exploration uh, that comes from discovering things on your own. And then another part of this is because this new version does not have or require an app. Now, there is a one part of the game where you do have to scan a QR code in order to get one of the clues, but it just directs you to a web page on Unidragon's, uh, a page on Unidragon's website. Though do know you will need some form of internet access to complete the quest as that QR code does lead to a vital clue, but that can come from any mobile device or you can even just do it on your PC. So they also dropped the whole uh, AR element. It barely worked and was never fully completed in Amazing Cappadocia. Uh, and I think this was a good choice. They had overstretched yeah. and, and realized they had and just pulled back from that. Yeah, totally agree on that one. Now, one new thing you're going to find here is that it has a hint system. Uh, this is greatly appreciated. Well, the hint system in Space Adventures is really just a, a line drawing of the map with some color-coded sections to tell you where to look for stuff. It really is all that's needed because the logbook walks you through everything else. Now, the other thing you're going to find more of here are game elements. Uh, now, there are little things like mazes on the map and there's find and seek quests. But there's also arcade style shooting ships and very basic tabletop games. This is quite the contrast to the very escape room in a box style experience that was in Amazing Cappadocia. Now, while you do get more games here, the games are very simple. You were mm -hmm. looking at things like tic-tac-toe and rolling dice to see who rolls higher. I, I think this is actually the most important thing to know about Quasal Space Adventures for uh, the regular tabletop bellhop audience of hobby board gamers. The game elements in this mashup of puzzle and game are incredibly simple and basic. Like we're talking grade school level schoolyard games here. Now, I will say I was at least impressed by the number of games. I was like, man, they put in way more. I like the fact that there's more game to this than the original. Um, I can't say the same for the rest of my family. Um, they were very disappointed and wanted something with some meat on it. I want to say more meat, but I don't even think there was meat there. They were especially disappointed. Like we could tell you're going to make these awesome dice and and you literally you roll a die. I roll a die who rolls higher wins like, like come on, that's a game. And while odds and evens, which is the whole thing where you're like you hold a bunch of stones and you hold out so many stones, your opponent says odds or evens. And if you're right, you take the stones from them. And if you're wrong, they get the stones. And whoever has the most stones at the end wins. Like th these, these are barely games. Yeah, it's interesting how much they changed it up. Um, but the choice of games in, in changing that up just becomes questionable. If you're going to attempt a puzzle of this difficulty, as we pointed yeah. out, it's a thousand piece puzzle. You don't expect preschool level games but i'm a hobby gamer and i'm holding what a, a puzzle game that might it, it is literally more accessible and family friendly than the first while the folks in my family all play a lot of games together and we wanted something more they have a feeling this is going to actually be more appealing to your average family who just loves doing jigsaw puzzles together and I think people are going to appreciate the quick and easy to play games. Uh, I don't know. They've clearly learned a lot from their crowdfunding experiences. I think the dropping of AR was a big yes. uh, sort of note that they got from that first uh, Amazing Cappadocia experience. But I'm not sure they learned all the right lessons. Either that or they are simply casting their net too wide for an audience and are risking satisfying none of them. I, for example, my family isn't the level of gaming your family is. And I right. would have a hard time believing that my kids would want to play tic-tac-toe or just roll to see who's higher, uh, you know, as part of a game to, uh, to solve a, a significant puzzle. 
Yeah, and and to be fair too, none of that's needed. Like they they threw in these games, but the games don't do anything. You like finish a chapter and then like now you sit down with the alien who you just helped and he introduces you to his favorite game, Tic Tac Toe. Like there's no reason to play the games. Like an actual quote from one of my kids was, No, I don't I won't play that. We don't have to, right? Let's just skip it. <laughs> like let's just move on to the next part of the puzzle. Um, and I'm the mean dad that made the kids play tic-tac-toe and roll the dice. Cause I, I'm like, I want the full quizzle experience We're we're, we're going to play these stupid games. Now with those games being so simplified and Sean already mentioned this, that what, what's not simple is the puzzle. The puzzle is thousand pieces is not a small puzzle. And, and they were, the, it, it's evil. There are a lot of straight edges in this puzzle that have nothing to do with the edges of the puzzle. And, and I've got to say that the most enjoyable part of this was putting the puzzle together, the, the actual jigsaw puzzle part of Quetzal Space Adventures. Uh, it took us three days to get it done. Like, and that's, and, and that was split up. Like, I, I don't know the number of hours, but like we set it up at night. The kids had a hard time getting him to bed. Gwen woke up at like 630 on the morning before anyone else in the entire house to go downstairs to the living room to work on the Quetzal and, and, and on the puzzle. And like, we worked on it throughout that day and we did other things, you know, we went downtown, we did some stuff, come back to my uncle's place and worked on the Quetzal for a bit more. Like it was spread out, but it took us three days to beat. And that is a stark contrast to the rest of these game five portions. Now I gotta say one of the best parts of the puzzle experience though, isn't necessarily just getting the right piece in the right place, right? Though it's, it's discovering the artwork here is fantastic. It's, it's that very busy style um I, with lots going on and kind of little stories right like discovering stories in the graphics um like i mentioned sitting down with the alien to play tic-tac-toe well in the story it talks about where that happens well that spots on the map and you can see the two aliens that were arguing on the map and my kids liked coming up with theories on what individual pieces were and what different pieces of artwork meant and because uh, like all unidragon puzzles you find unique shapes that have nothing to do with the puzzle so there's the uh, the space dog, you know, the, the dog with the big space hat was in there. And there were even some like two part ones. The dog, you found his head and then later we found his legs. Well, that that wasn't part of any of the mini puzzles. That wasn't anything else. That was just something interesting to discuss, discover while building the puzzle. And there were there were satellites and spaceships and then there was some weird two two multi part alien. And man, we kept just finding all these tentacles and we made a pile of tentacles eventually and the tentacles formed something like that's the stuff that's really neat about all of Unidragon's puzzles. And it was just as present here as it is in their others. Yeah. And that's reassuring that while they have learned lessons and they have made changes from the Amazing Cappadocia, what hasn't changed is that core puzzlers game within the Unidragon puzzles, which is yeah. really what what you expect from a Unidragon puzzle is that amazing and intricate puzzle and the the bizarre and, and, and intriguing pieces that they use mm -hmm. now we also had a lot of fun with the mini puzzles uh there's no spoiler here right i, I didn't call this a spoiler here review it's very obvious you go on the kickstarter page and the dragon's talking about it you know you're going to get mini puzzles uh though i gotta say dan and i let the kids handle the find and seek part um while the artwork is nice and bright and clear the details are very small um, and the things you're looking for are even tinier. So I will say, um, as uh, a, a, a two adults with aging eyes, um, that part of the puzzle was probably left to younger generations. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Unidragon makes great puzzles. That's what they do. Uh, yep. They are drifting and, and trying to find something uh, new and inventive within Quezzle, and they've gone in, in two sort of different directions now. It'll be interesting to see what happens uh, if and when we see a uh, a Quezzle Volume 3. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and I will say there is a third part coming. They they, they you, you get some hints towards that. Um, as for the quest part of this one, it was enjoyable. Um, it was fun, like like discovering each piece of the code was neat. The cryptex is cool. Like, like that, that was one aspect. As soon as I found it, I'm like, Oh, this, this is reminding me of some of the wooden puzzle boxes I've done. Right. You get this cool, it looks like Saturn and you got dials on it and there's letters on it. And you're like, Oh, I'm going to have to figure, I think it was numbers. You're going to have to figure out how to open this. And then when we opened it, it was just like a really cool. Cause it wasn't like a, you win. It was just another hint. And it was one of those where you pulled the hint out and we we're like, oh, I know exactly what that means. We're going to have to do this. And this is the part I'm not going to spoil. And uh, now you don't quite get 
the escape room in a box style series of clues that you got in Amazing Cappadocia. But what they did put in this is really good. Now, I will say the majority of it, though, is hide and seek, right? You're trying to find things. But there were just those little bits, even just opening the box, the whole you had to turn the dials to the right spot to open the box was was a nice touch. Yeah, no, I think they they have really advanced a long way from uh, some of the mistakes in Amazing Cappadocia. Uh, and while I think they, you know, could have conceivably made a couple of smaller missteps here, again, the core of Unidragon is the puzzle, uh, mm -hmm. and part, and with that comes the 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 which way, not which way, but yeah, uh, the, 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 the where the where's Waldo concept uh, sort yep. of uh, things that they do so well, and we're not missing out on that here. No, not at all. And and I think there's more in this than the last one, though I didn't count the number of pieces you had to find. Um, the other thing I will say is we use the hint page and, and props to Unidragon for including it. Uh, this was one of those, like, I let the kids look at thing, look at things and you can just, you know, read the kids body language when it seemed like they're kind of sick of looking for things. We were like, I, I kind of cheated. Like here's dad sitting back with the hints going, I think there's one over in the happy kingdom over there. <laughs> uh, there's one by the, remember the big purple dinosaur? Yes, there's dinosaurs. Um, uh, you might want to look over there. And what I liked about that is we used it pretty liberally, pretty quickly, which just removed any frustration. The only frustration, though, that we did have, and this has to be called out, I think, is building those 3D ships at the beginning. Um, the laser cut wood was is very expertly cut in all these puzzles. Like the pieces just fit. Like if your piece is on a bit of a bend, it's not going to slide in. It's got to be perfectly flat. And we've all developed our own little system for tapping on them to get them to fall in, right? Well, the ships are also like that, but you have to assemble these and there's like zero tolerance on these and everything just fits. Now, what this means is no glues required, which is awesome. Like, I, I love the fact that, it, excuse me, I love the fact that I did not require glue to build these ships. But it also meant I was the only one that could get the ships together. Um, and I would have liked to have had a, a some kind of mallet there. A rubber mallet would have been very useful for assembling some of these ships. Yeah, I think the range of ages you had participating in this helped. You had grown ups, you had, uh, you know, the, the young teens. Uh, the only thing mm -hmm. that might have maybe helped even more is having some even younger kids there who might have actually enjoyed playing tic tac toe and, and dice. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, overall, building and solving Quetzal Space Adventures was, was a great family experience. Uh, it became a fun part of a family vacation we took. Um, it's one I hope the kids will fondly remember for years to come. And uh, I have a strong feeling that before we go up next year, we're going to have to find some type of puzzle to bearing because I think that's going to be part of the experience when we travel up north. Um, despite being a family of hobby board gamers who all wish the game that were built into adventures were a little less simplistic, uh, maybe a lot less simplistic. Overall, we had a great time. Now, if you or your friends enjoy Jigsaw Puzzles, you should pick up a copy of Quizzle Volume 2 Space Adventures. It's a fantastic jigsaw puzzle that also presents you with some simple games to play, a fun Waldo-style quest system, and some other unique puzzle elements. Now, I also think this is going to be a good game to pick up for kids, for your kids, or, or to have for the, the, the neighbors to come over. Or even if you happen to be an educator, this could be a good classroom game. I'm going probably as far back. I, I don't know if kindergarten safe there. There might be swallowable bits in there would be a problem. But I think it'd be a good game to have that. This Quezzel is much more approachable than the last one. And it does a great job of leading you through each part of the game step by step. While the tabletop games included were too light for us, I think they're perfect for younger kids. As Sean mentioned, kids who enjoy tic-tac-toe still. Just make sure you have an adult on hand to help with building those spaceships. Well, for a look at a challenging puzzle-solving experience, or a murder mystery, or an escape room in a box-style experience, you're going to want to look elsewhere. Quizzle isn't yeah. going to scratch that itch for you. Maybe check out Body of Evidence, Best Served Cold, or La Famiglia, which we've both reviewed for something more to your tastes. Now, personally, what impressed me the most about this combination of puzzle and game is the progression that was made between Quezzle Amazing Cappadocia to Quezzle Space Adventures. This is a much more polished and approachable product. Unlike our last Quezzle review, I didn't feel the need to spoil part of the puzzles to make sure people are getting the most out of their game. 
I still get emails almost every week asking for help with solving the original. I don't think that's going to happen with the sequel. I think Unidragon learned a lot from the first game, and I am really looking forward to what they offer up next. I can only assume it's going to continue to get better. And as I noted earlier, we do know another one's coming. As when you finish Quezzo Space Adventures, you get a strong hint at what the theme of the next Quezzo will be. We're not going to spoil it, though. You'll have to solve Space Adventures yourself to discover what's next. Now, if you do decide to pick up Quezzo Space Adventures, if, if we were, we sold it to you tonight, um, it will be available at unidragon.com as of September 15th. And when you go there, be sure to use our code BELLHOP to save 10% off. That's it for our review of Quezzel Volume 2 Space Adventures, a new mashup of Puzzle and Jigsaw with a lot more game in the box than the last puzzle. Though those games are way simpler than we would have hoped, what do you think would have been a better choice? What kind of small, quick games would you like to see in a mashup of puzzle game and or puzzle and game like Quezzel? Now, for a more detailed look at this new puzzle, new Quezzle, sorry, be sure to stop by the blog, tabletopbellhop.com. Check out my written review. It's live right now. Also, if you enjoyed this review and the other content we produce, please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. And now in the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode, which is back a couple of weeks now. Yeah, a couple weeks worth, and, and for that amount of time, there was not a lot to actually talk about. Um, with everything going on, the only games that got played is while we were on vacation. So uh, in, in this, we like to talk about the games we play, but other things that we're doing. So I will say um, we enjoyed our trip up to Campbellford, Ontario. Um, going for a second time up there was much more enjoyable. Just in, I knew where things were. There were certain things we wanted to do. Um, I, the, the drive was just better because like, I knew what exit it was off the 401 and stuff like that. Um, we did spend the money to take the 407, which I, I'll never not take it again. I think because like uh, our last time up, we had figured it out. I think it took us 13 hours or something like that. Whereas this took us eight and that's what stopped for lunch. So that was nice. Um, Little things I'm going to call out for anyone who's in Ontario. You want to check these out. You want to go to Pierogi House in Kitchener. It's literally, I think it's number six is the highway, but you take the exit off the 401 and you drive down to where Sports World used to be. And there's a plaza and there's this little pierogi house in there, uh, which it ends up now a chain. They've expanded. They have two more locations where there's a little old woman in there that makes you fresh pierogies and it's fast food. Like you go up and you order, make your pierogies. Uh, what they've added is they now also have, um, what's the word, kibasa and schnitzel. And no, I did not try the schnitzel, despite my love of schnitzel, <laughs> for anyone who <laughs> listened to our last episode. I did not I did not grab the schnitzel, but I did, because I just didn't want a big piece of schnitzel for lunch when I had a long drive ahead of me. Yeah, but if, I did if, it's, try, if it sits wrong, that's just not how yeah, you want to be exactly. driving. I did try the kibasa. The kibasa was great, and they gave you way too much. It was like three big pieces cut in half, so like six pieces of kibasa. Wow. Probably could have been a meal on its own. Um, fantastic. So stop there. The other thing is, and, and I know people who live in the area know it, but the big apple is still awesome. It's this weird ass tourist trap that makes like thousands of apple pies a day and all kinds of apple stuff. But like they have an apple crumble bread that is just so good. And we did it last year and did this year. And we bring that to my uncles. And that's like one of the things we have for breakfast is like apple bread every day and you get cider. Um, the thing we got to do this time that we didn't last time is there was a 401 brewery there that had been closed every other trip. It was open this time. They don't brew beer. And when I see brewery, I just think beer, it ends up, it's all cider, but like, it's an amount of cider, like walking into, you know, like the LC, not the vineyards or whatever at like Meyer, not Meyer. Why am I saying Meyer Metro <laughs> where like they, they had like, I don't know, 23 different types of cider from cans into big bottles and everything. So we did try a bunch of ciders. So those those are a couple of places I want to call out um, just as as cool places to to stop for anyone who happens to be in Ontario that goes by those. Um, an amusing one on the way home. I know I'm jumping ahead here is I don't know if I mentioned it when I was talking about Dyson Logos being down about how Dyson Logos drove by a place called the drive through dinosaur exhibit and had to turn around and go through it. We found it somehow. We're leaving my uncle's and we took a different way to go home because Waze said it was quicker. 
um, than we normally do. And we drove by the drive through dinosaur place. So on our list for next year, when we go up as we are going to go through the drive through dinosaur, we did not because as it was, we were going to get into Windsor at like eight at night. And we didn't want to come in any later. All right. So all of that, um, we did go shopping one day and sad gamer. We're getting back to gamer stuff. All of the game stores closed now, all being two. Um, technically it was really none because before it, there was a bookstore, a really nice, like new bookstore where you buy new games or sorry, new books that had games and we bought points out. They're gone. Um, ends up, it was health issues for one of the owners and they were, they were forced to close down. Uh, oh, I guess there were three, sorry, there were three. Then there was a toy store that had a surprising number of board games, but it was mostly like blue orange stuff and escape room in a box. They're just gone. No, ex- no, no reason. And then there was a bait and tackle store that sold games workshop. Well, none of those made it another year. So that part kind of sucks, but I wasn't there to shop for games. I, <laughs> I did want to go back to the bookstore. Um, we did go to a couple antiques places uh, that had a mashup mix of stuff. Um, the What I did pick up is a copy of a board game, which I should have brought in here so I could hold it up, called Warp Out from 1985. And it's the deluxe edition that includes both Atlantis and the Bermuda Triangle. And you got to see this. Like, if you see it, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, it was five bucks. You would have bought it for five. I can't think anyone who listens to the show that wouldn't have bought this game for five bucks because it just looks fantastic. You're like moving around. You got to roll for alien attacks. It looks great. And shockingly, the fact that it was only five bucks, because was that at the same place where it was was a different uh, a different place? Oh, okay. Yeah, different place. Because we we some of the if, if people who who followed uh, some of the, your photos on on X or wherever uh, you could see the the four hundred and fifty dollar Nintendo Power Glove, and I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. the Nintendo Power Glove didn't work that well when it was new, and the Nintendo system was well supported. Uh, even hackers don't really mess around with the Power Glove because there's just <laughs> not that much it'll do. Uh yeah, the the. the... So one of the antiques place actually really nice called Bazaar, Pizar, Pizar, Bazaar. I always think it's a pizza place. Pizzazz. That's what it is. Pizzazz. And when you see it, I miss the extra Z and I'm like, oh, it's a pizza place. Because my uncle always complains there's no good pizza up there. Um, and I'm like, oh, no, that's an antiques place. And it's multi-floor. But it's one of those where they rent booths to people, like like different sections of the store, different people, and they right. set their own pricing. Some of the stuff in there is very reasonable. Deanna found a bunch of vintage um, postcards, which – Paid a really good price for it, which is pretty awesome. But yes, the the person who had vintage toys, uh, their press pricing was was I don't know, not what I would be willing to pay. But you know what? If if you're out in the middle of nowhere in Upper Canada, then maybe that's the only place you could possibly get a power club. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh- <laughs> um, I will say if you if you are into classic Dungeons and Dragons, uh, you can get some like mint condition copies of like Gold Greyhawk books. And I was tempted, but I'm like, I don't sell games anymore because I, I, I while I was there, I was looking up how much it was worth. And I'm like, that is in better shape than any copy of the original AD&D Greyhawk Adventures book I've ever seen. But it was thirty five bucks. And and I don't I don't know. I could bring it home. I could sell it on eBay. I could pack it up then I'll send it to some grognard. The grognard's going to open it up and notice there's like a hairline scratch in a corner and ask for his money back. So I decided not to deal with that. But if anyone's up by Campbellford, Ontario and collects classic D&D stuff, check out the antiques places downtown, because that, that was the best one, but there was a bit more. Oh, interestingly, I just checked eBay real quickly, and apparently Mint in Box, that's actually a pretty good price. No, no, it's not the box. It's a hardcover book. No, no, sorry, for, for the Power Glove. Oh, for the Power if it, Glove? If that's it was Mint in Box, price. that's actually a good price. Wow, but it wasn't a box. Yeah. I don't know if it was open before, but it was. it did have the box. Because pricing pricing star for the for like inbox with manuals and everything uh, was starting at like five hundred bucks on eBay. Well, there you go. I, I guess we should have bought the power club. <laughs> I have to assume anyone that owns one of these booths has access to eBay nowadays. You would and hope. does their yeah. research, right? I don't know. I was tempted by some Star Wars stuff, and and I got to say, I I am always tempted by Star Wars micro machines. Like I need to find them at dollar stores because I want them if I ever run a Star Wars RPG. Micro machines are the perfect scale for doing like a quick scene of the ships here. This is here. And here's where the guards are. I want them badly. I want every Star Wars micro machine ever produced, but I don't want to play. They're collectible, right? Because they don't make them anymore. And this guy had some Star Wars micro machines and I was very tempted. 
Not that I'm planning on running Star Wars anytime soon either, but I still want them. All right, games. Let's get to actual games we played. Um, first game we played, I can't remember if this was actually the first game we played, but one of the things we we did do is um, actually what was interesting. Is my mom played a lot of games, which was cool. Not with us though. Um, the um, my aunt and her sister was over the whole time we were there, and they play cards like constantly. Like that's just what the two of them do is play cards. And by cards, I mean like simple, uh, not simple, simple, not simple. Wrong word. Um, <laughs> traditional playing, traditional card playing card games. games. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's the word I'm looking for. Simple is the wrong word. Um, they played a ton of hand and foot, which looked fascinating. I've never seen it. My aunt actually has a tray. She has purchased or maybe my uncle 3d printed it. I don't know, but for playing hand and foot where like for tossing the cards, I'd never even seen this game before. Um, they played some crib. They did some euchre. My mom joined in. They were doing three handed euchre. Um, they were doing three player crib. Like, uh, like there was always people playing games at that table. It was kind of cool. Um, for us though, the second day there, we set up the Quezzle. And as we just talked about in the review, it took us three days to complete it. And it was one of those in and out, right? So we would, when gets up early works on the Quezzle, we're up for a bit. We decided to head over to Crow Bridge which Crow Bridge is the the most beautiful national uh, provincial provincial park. I think I've ever been in with this awesome swimming spot. Um, we head out there, then we come back and we work on the puzzle a bit more. And then dinner is served. We all eat dinner. Then we go back and work on the Quezzle some more and so on. Um, so we played Quezzle. And, and as I said in the review, it was fun. I, I, I recommend it. It's was better than the first one, even if the games are a little too simple. First uh, game we played, though, that I brought was we set through. Oh, it's a municipal conservation area. My correction, Crow Bridge Municipal Conservation Area. Still beautiful, like like just absolutely breathtaking. It's it's I don't know. I, <laughs> we're not a show about national parks or parks, so I will move on. Uh, we played Distilled, um, introduced it to Gwen. D and I played was that our third game, fourth might have been our fourth game. Uh, Gwen really liked it. So again, Gwen and her AP made the game twice as long as it should have been. Um, but just it's, it's such a solid game. I, I am really impressed by Distilled. Uh, we tried a different tasting menu this time, which changed things up more than I expected. Um, it was a close game. Uh, Gwen did surprisingly well for being her first play, because that's the one thing that her AP does reward, is she does tend to find the right move. Um, yeah, I love and Distilled. Uh, my family was not at all interested. <laughs> I kind of hoped like they'd see it and I'd be able to kind of talk, uh, especially Debbie, my, my aunt's, my aunt's sister. It was, was the most interested. I might've been able to get her to play, but they were both, and eh, this seems a little overwhelming for us, but for the family distilled, still solid, uh, a couple more plays. We should be able to review that one. Uh, just need Sean to try it. So yeah, excellent. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Good to hear that, uh, Gwen was able to pick it up, uh, easily, yeah. even if, uh, she did struggle to uh qu play quickly <laughs> yeah, that's that's every game uh we did offer genevieve to join but she just eh, wasn't interested fair enough i think she worked on the quezzle while we were playing distilled uh the other big one was telestrations this was a eight player game um we bought new dry erase markers um so so brought those up um that, that is just such a good game uh with, with i don't know I, telestrations is just good um, went over fantastic, like, like absolutely fantastic. Like, you know, you, you don't always see your relatives. Like, it's my godfather, my, my uncle Claude. And like, I just not a very serious man, but like to see him doubled over laughing is just awesome. Um, the kids were laughing, uh, no four legged ducks this year. So, so we don't get to make fun of any of that. But, um, my, my aunt's sister had to draw a U.S. flag. And I don't know if it's because I'm in a border city. Like, I guess they're far enough up north in the middle of nowhere of Canada. that They don't know what a U.S. flag looks like. Yeah, and they swapping, drew it so the swapping the stars and stripes yes. was an interesting choice, yes, I have to say. Exactly. Oh, it was so funny because she, she swapped it. So in the top corner were the stripes and the rest of the flag was lines of stars. And and we're like, and, and like the four-legged duck, when you get that past you, you're like, why did they swap those? That must <laughs> be an important clue to figuring out what this means. And no, they were just trying to draw a U.S. flag. Um, so I don't know if my uncle's going to send down a 3D printed backwards U.S. flag this year like he did with the duck. But um, so that was a ton of fun. Telestrations are awesome. Went over especially well. This is the first time Debbie had played. Um, one of the best parts was just um, 
yeah, so so Deanna's pointing out the 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 Jen was the next person and saw it and wrote backwards American flag. <laughs> I don't even remember what the original clue was, but that, that's the other thing with television. And and we did not keep score. We we literally tossed out the score. Yeah, we've said many times on this show that you know telestrations is fun. Why do you want to ruin it with scorekeeping? Yeah, well, once you do scorekeeping, you're playing favorites, right? Because you got to pick your favorite pitcher and your favorite guests. And once you do that, you get into the bad feelings and stuff like that. So yeah, great game. Um, surprisingly, though, what I think was a bigger hit for my relatives, uh, specifically my aunt and her sister, was the Deadlies. Um, the Deadlies is from Smirk and Laughter Games. I'm pretty sure I talked about it last week when we were talking about, or sorry, two weeks, whenever Gamer, we were last Gamers last. Uno was the description we used. Yes. Gamers Uno. Yes. Which is it? You're trying to avoid your hands of cards. Uh, there's seven suits, number one to seven in each suit. And as you play each card, it does something funky. And the goal is to get rid of your hand. It's from Smirk and Laughter, Smirk and Dagger. I don't remember which of those two brands it's under, but this is a take that game. And, and sometimes I like those. Sometimes I don't. In this kind of quick playing fast card game, I love it. Like I, it, you're one card away and someone makes you pick up 80 cards and you play Wrath back and forth 10 times and then someone lusts you and you gotta grab another card. But that's okay because then you have pride and you get to swap your hand or whatever. I'm oh, sorry, Envy. Envy is what lets you swap your hand with the person who happens to have one of the special cards that lets you win instantly and so on. This game does some awesome stuff to fix player elimination problems and stuff like that and ha- not having to keep track of scores. Like finishing a round of Uno and everyone having to hand up their hand. That's all gone. And it just all it's really simple is once you're elim- once you void your hand, you turn your little score tracker from six at the beginning to four and then you draw four cards. You do it again. You turn to two and draw two cards. And if you do it again, you win the game and it's over. And that combined with the, the, the rapid fire play. My mom even played this one. My mom liked the Deadlies. So there there's a good indication. My mom, who, who swears she doesn't like games, actually played the Deadlies and enjoyed it. Um, this was one that like when we're leaving on. um. On uh, Labor Day, my uncle's like, don't forget, you have to send me an email with where to get the Quezzle and where to get the Deadlies. And for some reason, I can't find the Deadlies in Canada right now. Mm. Now, I don't know if it just premiered at Origins when we got to see it or not, but I couldn't find it in a Canadian source. Now, my uncle was perfectly willing to go to Amazon and buy it on Amazon US where it was on sale and got it shipped to him, which is cool. And uh, which is awesome. So, yeah, my uncle's already bought two copies, uh, one for my aunt and her sister to play and one for seniors. So my aunt and uncle are very involved in the local seniors community center in Campbellford and do a lot with them. And they're like, no, this is going to be a game the seniors will like. Um, You're going to get some snickering because it's the seven deadly sins and people laugh when they play the, the lust card. But this is the perfect kind of take that game for them. Because of how quick it plays, it's not that long. It's not like playing a full round of crib and tracking scores. You don't need pen and paper. This is going to go over fantastic. So uh, that's some of the best shining praise I've heard for that game yet. So we'll probably be reviewing the Deadly soon. And I I have nothing bad to say about the game. Yeah, I mean, I've played it a few times now. We played it while we were down in down at Origins. And it was just a really good game. And and it was... It was a little weird because I went. I don't think we. I don't think any of us really understood what we were expect, like what to expect when we first cracked no. it open. And Not then as soon as we started playing it, it was like, oh, okay, this is that. Okay, perfect. Mm. And it, I mean, you just pick it up that fast. There's yeah. not. There's not even really any sort of instructional needed. You just kind of play. It's you know, get rid yeah. of your cards and do what the card says. Read what's on them. Yeah, and the Read only thing on you have card. to pay attention to is which card when you're playing multiple cards, which one's on top. Yeah. That's it. Such a solid game. No, it is. Uh, uh, thank you, Kurt, or thank you. Pat yourself on the back for uh, basically forcing us to take a copy home from Origins. We were about to leave his booth, and he's like, "No, no, take this too." Yeah. So, thank you, Kurt, for uh, for getting us to take it. All right. Well, that's it for what you have been playing. Uh, what about what you plan to play next? Uh, any gaming plans for the coming week? Well, so the big thing is this coming Saturday, this only will matter for those of you who are live. It happened to be in Windsor area on Saturday, September the 16th. We will be hosting our next barbershop bar game night, uh, along with the CG realm, local friendly local game store here in Windsor. Hope to see all of you locals here. Uh, That should lead to some gameplays to talk about next week, though. As I mentioned, I am not sure uh, what we can get to. So. We may not have the selection available as we usually do, though. Ian always brings a bunch of stuff from the CG realm 
and there'll be fan favorites like, you know, Carcassonne and Gloom and stuff like, or not Carcassonne, Catan, Gloom and the stuff he brings every week. So there will be games available. Don't worry. There won't be something, but more so than most weeks. If you, if you have something at your own, you want to bring, feel free to bring it. Um, I'm thinking of grabbing distilled in case it's, I don't have to spend the whole night. Cause that way Sean can try it. I'll probably also bring Kapow because as I noted, some of the, um, the stuff we have to review, I had pulled out and I may bring out castle panic, which I think I'll set up and that might get people to play it. But other than that, I'm not sure. Now, as for reviews, um, we're good on boop. We could review boop. I'm pretty sure we could review the deadlies. I'll definitely bring the deadlies. Actually. That's a good one. Um, uh, I'm thinking next week will be re- boop and tapple. Um, really, we should be able to review the deadlies, uh, castle panic. I'm pretty much good to go. Finally. I know that's a long awaited one. I don't even know if anyone cares at this point. I've been talking about the game so long. Um, but yeah, I could do a castle panic review. So, so as I noted earlier, when we were talking about, um, with the water damage and, and its impact, we're actually in pretty good shape for reviews for the next couple of weeks. So um, I think Sea of Havoc still unburied. So that's one. Maybe if we can put together a game night and play at the kitchen table some night, we could get that one done, too. And I am uh, I am in town this weekend, so I will be at the barbershop playing games as well. And we'll have something to talk, something or other to talk about uh, on the next episode (laughs) as well. Sounds good. Before we start locking things down, let's take a moment to thank a selection of our Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patrons. Their support helps keep this show going. Welcome to our latest Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patron, Carlos, a.k.a. Tycho, from the Tabletop Bellhop Discord. Welcome, Carlos. Uh, Next up, Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Mom. Uh, Valentine Page, thank you. Chris Leary, thank you, Chris. And Brian Sheehan. Thank you, Brian. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. Though the doors are closed, even through the renovations, you can always find us at TabletopBellhop.com. All over the web is Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Uh, You can also find us over on Discord at Tabletop Bellhop, or sorry, discord.tabletopbellhop.com everything's dot tabletopbellhop.com that's the word we say the most you got to say it 11 times or remember in people's heads or something like that tabletopbellhop.com well that's all for us tonight if you enjoy the, our content leave a review a comment or a like wherever you find it drop by youtube and try a totally free subscription for the tabletop bellhop gaming podcast i'm sean and i'm mo thank you and, and game, game on, on.